Whatever one's opinion may be of the song Yellow Submarine, you can't ignore the fact that it's a very interesting recording. Besides the pile of sound effects, there is an infectious melody that, once you hear, is difficult to erase from your head, even if you hate it. Well, love it or hate it, though, you can't deny that it was an international commercial success. And, being such an interesting recording, there are some things that only hardcore Beatles fans know about, and I will now convey to you a few of those. So, sit back and enjoy an auditory journey called Seven Things That You Didn't Know About Yellow Submarine. Number seven. Ringo always got a song on an album, and this was his on Revolver. Early on, George Martin decided, and the band agreed, to have Ringo sing one song on every Beatles album. Now, Ringo was a nice guy, but this tactic wasn't just to be nice to him, it was simply good marketing. You see, in the first wave of Beatlemania, Ringo was voted among the fan base to be the most popular Beatle. The guys and EMI had no intention of disenfranchising those fans, hence the one Ringo song per album policy was born. Paul conceptualized the song specifically to match Ringo's personality and pictured a story about life beneath the sea. John Lennon developed the verse melody and then the duo began developing the song along with the collaboration of Donovan Leach, who ended up providing the line, Sky of Blue and Sea of Green. Number 6. The Drug Connection Rumor Inspecting the title and lyrics, some listeners viewed the song as a code for the drug culture, particularly since the barbiturate and ebutol, which was sold in yellow capsules, were known on the streets as yellow jackets. It wasn't a huge leap in their evaluation to translate the jargon from yellow jacket to yellow submarine. It is true that Lennon had thought of an underwater craft when he and Harrison and their wives first took the hallucinogenic drug LSD in early 1965, but there's no specific reference that I could find to that specific experience as being the basis for either the title or any of the lyrics. Musicologists Russell Rising and Jim LeBlanc also see Yellow Submarine as, and I quote here, introducing travel-related imagery to align with a psychedelic journey conveyed in an LSD trip, a theme used more introspectively in Tomorrow Never Knows, where Lennon exhorts the listener to float downstream. So, there you go. I guess. Number five. The song originally had a narrative at the beginning, but it flopped. The song originally opened with a 15-second section, including a marching feet sound effect created by blocks of coal being shaken inside of a box, and some dialogue written by Lennon. From Landa Groats to John O'Green, with Stephanie do we trade? As sometimes happens during the creative process, though, at the conclusion of recording this intro, which took some time, the band chose to discard the idea because, frankly, it was boring to listen to, and the section ended up being cut from the track on the 3rd of June during final mixing. Number 4. Tracks 1 and 2 were just the usual stuff. Most of the day and night of the May 26, 1966 session was spent rehearsing the song and recording four takes of the rhythm track. Following a reduction mix of take four, Ringo recorded his lead vocal and then he, Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison sang backup vocals over the choruses. Interestingly, Ringo's vocal and the backup vocals as well were recorded against a playback at 47.5 hertz, so they were sung at one semitone flat. When played back at normal speed, 50 hertz, the voices would be pitched at G, the key in which the song was written, but would sound slightly thinner than they would if they were recorded at full speed. The recordings were processed with a couple of reduction mixes, taking the four tracks down to two, so that now sound effects could be added on the open tracks three and four. Number three, the sound effects. 
Sound effect overdubs began on the afternoon of June 1st, 1966, with an entourage of the Beatles, Girlfriends, Wives, Mick Jagger, Brian Jones, Roadies Mal Evans and Neil Aspinall, and limo driver Alfred Bucknell. At the end of the afternoon recording session, a dinner break was declared. I'll put the word dinner in quotes here because upon returning to the studio, it was reportedly apparent that there was more likely a lot of other things that were consumed besides food. Under this circumstance, the remainder of the sound effects were recorded. Intended to be maritime and party-oriented, here they are, in no particular order. John Lennon blowing bubbles into water using a straw. Lennon, again, shouting naval phrases into a microphone that was connected to his Vox guitar amplifier within the studio's echo chamber. George Harrison swirling water in a metal bathtub. Two ship's bells being rung. A noisemaker being rattled. Low-level, unintelligible voices to create a party atmosphere. Chains being rattled in the bathtub. Clinking glasses from a hallway outside the studio, Star yelling, cut the cable, whooshing sound effects, Lennon's Life of Ease echo vocals, a marching band bass drum being played by Mal Evans, an ocarina played by the Rolling Stones' Brian Jones, you hear that during the third verse, a rubber band propeller being wound up and put into water, coins being scattered, a foghorn, and finally the final sing-along. Number two. Was there a brass band there or not? Although the report from Jeff Emmerich is that he and George Martin used a recording of a brass band from EMI's tape library for the effect, George Martin stated in his 2008 book The Beatles Off the Record that a brass band was actually present in the studio. Since both men were present at the session, it would appear that no one really knows whether or not a band was present, so we can speculate. Personally, I think it did originate from an archive library tape, as there is specific information from two third-party sources regarding its use. The first being on Kenneth Womack's book, The Beatles' Encyclopedia, Everything Fab 4, on page 1027, and the second on Robert Rodriguez's book, Revolver, How the Beatles Reimagined Rock and Roll, on page 142. To wit, and this is a quote, to fill the two-bar gap following the line and the band begins to play, Martin and Emmerich use a recording of a brass band from EMI's tape library. They disguise the piece by splicing up the taped copy and rearranging the melody. And now, number one. Radio play by marketing decision. The song made it to number one on the UK singles chart primarily based upon the success of Eleanor Rigby, as Yellow Submarine was the B-side of that record. But in the US, due to the controversies surrounding Lennon and his unfortunate more popular than Jesus quip, and hence the commercial hesitancy of exposing the religious references in Eleanor Rigby, Capitol Records made Yellow Submarine the A-side of the US single. In fact, Yellow Submarine made the top 10 on 20 different charts worldwide, with 14 of those 20 making it number one. In the U.S., the song peaked at number two on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and number one on the Cashbox Top 100. It was an undeniable hit. The song Yellow Submarine, created during the sessions for Revolver, was one product of the blossoming experimental era of the Beatles, and that arguably began with the Rubber Soul album. It also tapped into producer George Martin's previous work on comedy recordings and radio work with the members of The Goons. By the time it was finished, the single song Yellow Submarine had consumed twice as much studio time as the Beatles' entire first album, Please Please Me. Although analyzed and inspected for deeper meaning by both listeners and scholars, by all real accounts, the song had no other purpose than to be a playful song for Ringo to sing. Still, after all these years, despite that international number one status, it does seem to be either a love-it-or-hate-it piece. But no matter upon which side of that fence you may sit, 
My guess is that you're still playing the thing in your head right now. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if so, please click that like button and leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. It would be a great time to subscribe to the channel. It's free, and you can just click on that subscribe button anytime and use the top notification bell so that you'll be notified of new videos right when they're available. If you're already a subscriber, consider upgrading your subscription to channel member status and enjoy early access to new videos days before they are available to the general public. Thanks again for watching.